So Jesus, he, you know, we know about his birth, born in a manger, you know, the whole nine yards. And then we don't know anything about him until like he's two years old. You know when the wise men go visit him? Did you know that nativity scene where the wise men are there, that's not biblical? If you read it, it says, and when Jesus was a young boy, they came into the house. Not to the manger, the house. So he was about two years old when the wise man, remember, they didn't have GPS, they didn't have trucks, they had to go on camels. It takes a long time to drive, to walk. So anyways, two years old, you know, they visit the house, they give the gifts, right? And then, as a matter of fact, Herod kills all the kids two and under. So Jesus is two years old at this time. And then he, Jesus appears in the Gospels when he's being baptized in the Jordan River, right, by John the Baptist. So from the time Jesus is born to the time that he's two years old, we know nothing about Jesus till he manifests in the desert about to be baptized by John the Baptist. At this point, he's 30 years old. So Jesus is born, he's two years old, and he's over here 30 years old. And there's really nothing in between. We don't know nothing about his adolescence, his teenage years, any miracles, any raising of the dead, and nothing, no, no parables. He's born, he's two years old, now he's 30 years old. And in between, we know nothing of his life, nothing except one little event that takes place when he's 12 years old. And I want to read that. So if you've got your Bibles, go with me to Luke chapter 2. Jesus here, uh, they're on the way to a festival, to a feast uh, in Jerusalem with his family. Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 51. Ten verses is all we really know about his life, okay? And it says here, uh, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Now when they had finished the days, they returned. The boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposedly that they had been with the company, they went a day's journey, and sought him among the relatives and the acquaintances. But when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. So now it was that, that uh, three days later, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they, the parents, saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you with, you know, great, uh, uh, anxiously, right? And he, Jesus, said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them, right? So here they go. They go on a trip, and it wasn't just them. It was the acquaintances, the relatives, they all got into a caravan and off they went to Jerusalem. And on the way back, they all went back. And so they left. Nobody took hold of, well, where is he? Okay, is he with you? Okay, let's, no. Well, he's probably with one of the cousins, so, you know, John the Baptist. Well, just, let's go back. It wasn't until a day later that they don't find him. And I can speak to this, Terry. Because when I was a wee young lad, probably about 10, 12 years old, we used to go to Mexico. No big deal. Yeah, it was. We used to drive. It takes three days to drive to Mexico. And it was, you know, my parents, my sister and I, my Aunt Maria, my Uncle Ramon, and their four kids, my cousins, you know, Cookie, Poncho, Rick, and Luis, and then my cousin, my, my, my uncle's friend, David, and his daughter, and then Manuel, Toya, and their three boys. So, we, like, a big caravan drove down to Mexico, right? And so, you know, we get in our cars, we drive to the border, to Detroit, cross the bridge, and when we cross the other side, let's get a cup of coffee, or back then, you know, get a, a soda. And everybody said, well, I don't want to go with my parents. I want to go with Luis. No, I want to be with Carmen. No, I want to be with Ricky. And every, all the kids went in different cars. Nobody knew where the kids were, but we knew that they were in the company. And so on the way back here, oh, well, he's probably with John the Baptist or, or with, uh, with, you know, with Uncle Moses or he's, he's somewhere. And they go a day's journey and no, he's not. So now they go back and they're anxious and they finally find him and he's in the temple in the midst of the teachers. And uh, they said, you know, we've been uh, seeking you anxiously. What happened? Where have you been? And Jesus said, look, well, look what Jesus did not say. Because he answered, you know, they asked him, why have you done this to us? And so he didn't say, Mom, come on, I'm 12 years old. I'm a big boy now. You don't have to worry about me. Or, hey, you know, I, I lost my bus fare. I was kind of thinking, how am I going to get? No, he didn't say that. He goes, you know, oh, he could have said a whole bunch of different things. You know, I, I got stuck here with these guys. They ask interesting questions. I don't get this at home. So I thought I'd hang up. No. He said, why do you seek me? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? 12 years old. I must be about my father's business. Now, in biblical interpretation, and I get to this in my book, and, I, and I've taught this, there's a rule called the rule of first mention. That every time you see something mentioned for the first time, a word, an event, 
Uh, it basically defines that word or event in its priority and how important it is in the word and how important it is to the Lord. Like in Genesis when Abimelech takes Sarah to be his wife from, you know, from Abraham, uh, God appears to him in a dream and says, you know, I should kill you because you got another man's wife. He says, hey, I, I haven't touched her. But he told me, you know, that was my sister, his sister. And he goes, yeah, that's why, you know, we're, we're all good. But go back to him, Abraham, and he's a prophet. He will pray for you. That's the first time in the Bible we see the word prophet. And what do prophets do? They don't prophesy. They pray. If you're really a prophetic voice, your first priority is prayer. And so even though the word is used and it, you know, it kind of morphs or evolves, that first event, that first understanding is the major importance of the word priority. So this is the first time we see Jesus speak any words. We don't hear him say, Gaga, Daddy, Mommy, nothing. You know, These are the first words that he says when he's 12 years old. Why did you seek me? In other words, yeah, you're my mom and you're my dad, but why did you seek me? Because really my whole thing is the, my father, not you, in a kind of nice kind of way, right? But did you not know that I must be about my father's business? At 12 years old, Jesus knew the priority of his life was to be about the father's business, to be about the father's work. At 12 years old, young people back there on your phones, look at me this way. All of you, look at me. When Jesus was 12 years old, he knew his call in life was to be about the Father's business. You're all, you know, we saw this thing about, you know, college and career. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, I believe I will be on that Zoom call answering any questions you may have apologetically, whatever. I'm, I'll probably be on that call, okay? So if you have any questions, you can, you can ask me, okay? But at 12 years old, Jesus knew that his whole life centered around being about the Father's business, not what am I going to do in college, what am I going to learn? Now, that's important, Know your career, know what you want to do, but wherever God puts you, you got to be about the Father's business. You have to work, okay? And so this morning, I'm going to speak about salvation, but the one thing that many Christians overlook, okay, uh, to be about the Father's business, now what exactly does it mean to be about the Father's business? What did it have to do with us? And the question is everything, especially in light of our salvation, okay? I'll get to that. Now, I wrote a book. It's called After the Fall, The Lie That Keeps You Coming Back to Church, right? And in other words, when people get saved, they say a prayer, they receive Jesus in their hearts, and then, then, then they do the Christian thing. What do they do? They pray, they read the Bible, and they go to church. And after a while, because church becomes the center focus of what you do, most people become saved to church, not saved to God, okay? But anyways, in this book, uh, I, there's a quote from, uh, from Acts where it says, heaven must accept Jesus until God restores all things. And the word restore in Greek means to restore back to state before the fall, after the fall. And so when God created Adam, when he created mankind, it was with a purpose. He created Adam for three things, the three pillars of salvation. And when we are born again, salvation is not saying a prayer to receive Jesus. That's just the first step. Salvation is positional. We are restored to the place Adam had before he fell. And we inherit these three things. Number one, intimacy. When God creates Adam, it wasn't to go to church. You here today, you are not created to go to church or to be part of a religious organization. You were created for intimacy with God. The Bible says that, that Adam was placed in the garden and God would meet him would, in the cool of the day. God would walk with him, talk with him, and so God would show up. God would stop doing his God things. Adam would stop doing his Adam things and he would meet. And, and the way, the nonchalant way kind of way, it's written here in the Hebrew, it depicts that it was actually a daily event. Very commonplace. Every day God would meet with Adam and they would meet and they would have a time of intimacy. And every day, that intimacy with God began to grow and began to cultivate. Something else about intimacy, it demands presence. Now, you may have 1,000 friends, 5,000 friends on your Facebook, but you don't have a relationship with them. I have a very good friend I've known for five years now, and we've connected two, three times a week on, uh, you know, on social media, on platforms. Great friend of mine, really respect the man, but I don't have a relationship with him. Because relationship depends... Presence, you gotta be with the person. You gotta spend time with them. So in order to have intimacy with God, you gotta spend time with God. So Adam lost that because of the fall, but in, rest, in salvation, we're restored back to intimacy with God through a relationship. Number two, authority, right? God gave Adam, so here, you know, multiply, be blessed, subdue the earth, have dominion, 
God gave Adam authority to subdue the earth. In that place, that can only happen in a place of, um, of relationship, authority is given out. Adam lost it, but we reclaim it because Jesus says in Luke 10, 19, I've given you authority to tread upon snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So that was recovered. Authority and uh, relationship. The third thing is what I want to park on and speak the rest of this message is work. Now, I've spoken on this before, but I want to elaborate on it. Believe it or not, work is part of your salvation and part of the kingdom of God. Work. W-O-R-K. When Jesus said he must be about his father's business, he was doing the work of the kingdom. The very first thing you hear Jesus come out of his mouth is, I have to work. And if Jesus had to work, we have to work. If it's the Father's business, then it's our business. Part of your salvation is the work that you're supposed to do. There's no such thing as a lazy Christian. There's no such thing as laziness. If you look at the Proverbs, it talks about the lazy man, right? We are expected to work. Now, there's a problem in the church. I've been a Christian 25 years, and I've been in leadership many times, many places, and one thread that I've seen in every environment, church environment, is the lack of participation of work. Pastor says, hey, this Saturday we have uh, an event. We're going to paint the church. We're going to scrub the floors. We're going to lay some carpet. We're going to do whatever. Hey, we need some people to, to come take care of the kids for ch children's church. Who's in? Crickets. Nobody puts their hands up. Well, it's inconvenient. The kingdom of God is inconvenient. When the pastor who's over God's house says we need to do this for the Lord, and I'll get to this at the end, every hand should go up. I'm willing to work in the house of the Lord. Why? Because I'm a Christian, and part of my salvation is I have to work. Now, I'm not condemning you. I'm condemning me because I should be working more. There's more I could be doing for the kingdom of God. But every, and this is, maybe I'm just, uh, I'm on my soapbox here, but this is one of the things that peeves me. When there's something to be done in the, work, in the house of the Lord, nobody wants to come to work. When it's mandated by God that part of your salvation is the work you're supposed to do. And I'll get to that. You still love me? I know Terry does, that's all that matters. Thank you, Thank you Terry. <laughs> Terry and friends, you guys are awesome. For, uh, for years, amen, okay. So, um, so now why is work such a problem in the church? And I believe the main reason is we don't understand salvation. For most, when you say so, what does it mean to be saved? Oh, I said yes to Jesus. He's in my heart. And, you know, I pray. I read the Bible at home. Oh, I go to church on Sundays. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I clocked in. I'm good. So all I got to do is pray, read the Bible, and come to church on Sundays. And keep my nose clean. Throw some money in the plate when it comes by. I'm good. I'm saved. Absolutely wrong. Okay? Now, instead of going, uh, trying to uh, speak through all this thing about work, I'm just going to read out of my book. Okay, because I, I dedicated a whole chapter on work. Three things, three pillars of salvation. Intimacy through relationship, authority, and work. So you have to bear with me here. I'm, it's me quoting me. And it sounds, I know it sounds kind of weird. I'm, I'm quoting myself here. Okay. Um, remember in salvation, we are restored back into Adam's place before he fell. God saves us for a purpose, and it restores us to the purpose he created Adam for. Okay, part of the purpose of this, and I will use the rule of first mention, every time you see something mentioned, an event or a word for the first time, okay, is that it, it really, um, really depicts the priority and, and the foundational meaning of that word or of the event, okay? So the rule of first mention. Even though God's progressive creation is seen in Genesis 1, this chapter is not in chronological order. Genesis chapter 1 is not in chronological order. Chapter 2 actually fits in between Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. So you can read Genesis chapter 1, go to chapter 26, stop, read chapter 2, and then come back and read verse 27 until you finish chapter 1, okay? Because chapter, the rest of chapter 1 deals with Eve. Chapter 2 deals just with Adam. Okay, now that's important. See, the very first thing God did after he created Adam was not give him a wife. It wasn't give him a wife. He created a garden and put Adam in there, and this purpose, and God's purpose for doing this is seen in verse 15. And the Lord took God, put man in it, in the Garden of Eden, to tend and to keep it. Now the rule of first mention states that when a word or event is seen for the first time, it gives us an understanding of the foundational truths of that word or the event. It can even give us the priority of the meaning of that word or the event. Okay, so it's really important, in other words. So as we see here, the priority, 
The very first thing God did with Adam after he created him was to put him to work. Not to give him a wife. The first thing God did with Adam was give him a job. Put him to work. All right? Rule of first mention. What's the first thing man did? He went to work. And if we are saved and restored back to Adam's place before he fell, we inherit intimacy and authority. And guess what? Work. It's not rocket science. Uh, anyways. Um, there are two pivotal words used in Genesis 2.15, to tend and to keep. The word tend means to labor, to work, to do work for another, to serve by labor, to serve God, and to make oneself a servant. The word keep means to keep, to have charge of, to keep, to guard, to keep watch, to ward, to protect, to save life. In short, even before God gave Adam his wife, his life partner, he gave him a job. A job. Adam was given stewardship over God's creation, responsibility, and work. When God created man, it was for a purpose, and I'm sorry to have to state the obvious, but that purpose involves work. Work. Okay? Not, 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 a, not, not a popular message, I know. Okay? We were created to be servants of God, and everywhere the Bible speaks of servanthood, it's always in the context of a slave doing the work and the will of a master. That is why it mean, that's what it means to have a Lord. So, when you are saved, it's not about saying a prayer and coming to church and keep your nose clean and just sit there till the day you die and you go to glory. No, you are restored, what is restored in your life that you did not have before was intimacy with God. Now you can approach him anytime you want. The God of the universe, the creator, will stop what he's doing to be with you. And you cultivate that relationship in his presence. The second thing is authority. Right? Now you can do warfare. Now you know who you are in the Lord and you can bind and loose these things because you have authority. And number three, you got to strap on the boots, put the blue collar, and get your hands dirty and get to work. If you really say, if I really say that we're saved and we don't work, we're missing 33% of our salvation, which we will, and I will show you, give an account for before the Lord. All right? Not a popular message. Okay. Adam was given stewardship of God's creation, responsibility, and work. Okay, so that includes work. Now, even more daunting is that we will be judged by the Lord for the work we did and did not do. Oh, that's the whole lot of hooey. I'm not going to be judged. Christ was judged for me. I'm not going to stand before the judgment seat. Yes, you are. You're not going to stand before the great white throne judgment. That's for sinners. You said yes to Jesus. Jesus was judged for you. Your sins have been paid for. No, you will not stand before the great white throne judgment to be Judge for your sins. You will be judged for your works. You don't believe me? Let's look at what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all, not just me, Eddie, and Kat, all, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what we, we have done, good or bad. Now you go back to 1 Corinthians 3.13. Each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. In other words, what's going to happen when you meet Jesus face to face, you're going to be like Santa Claus. You're going to have this big bag. And, uh, 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 Jesus, uh, here's everything I did for you, all the works. Jesus is going to go, yeah, it looks kind of empty. Well, but I did some things. Well, let's find out how good they are. He's going to spread them on the floor. Stand back. I don't want you to get singed. Stand back. And <sighs> fire is going to come out of heaven and burn everything that you've ever done for Jesus. Whatever remains is gold, silver, and precious rubies. You will get a reward. However, if it burns up and becomes ashes, wood, and hay, you get zip, noodle, nada, nothing. Now, you're still saved. You're not condemned but you get no eternal reward. You could work all your life, kill yourself to get that nice car, to get that nice house with the white picket fence. And at the end you die, somebody else gets it. And get to heaven and you get Zippo, nothing. Or you can invest your time and work in the things of God and have a mansion and rewards that are eternal. Our life is but a vapor. You can live 120 years, does not compare to all eternity, okay? And what you do in terms of work is gonna determine the rewards that you get, okay? 
The Bible makes it clear that all Christians will stand before the throne of Christ, the bema seat of Christ, it's in Greek, and be judged. Again, you're not gonna be judged for your salvation, but your, your works will be judged. So let me just emphasize that, emphasize that again. Your works will get judged and your eternal rewards will depend on what you did or did not do. Go back to Luke 2, 41 through 51. The very first words we hear Jesus speak. Why, why were you seeking me? In other words, it's not so much what you want me to do, mom and dad, even though I respect you, right? Because it says that he went back and he was obedient to them, right? There's no, nothing there that's bad. But he said, I must be about my father's business. At young people, at 12 years old, Jesus, the child, knew that his whole life centered around doing God's will and purpose for his life. Whatever God wanted Jesus to do, that's what he was gonna do. Jesus spent his whole life working the works of God, advancing the kingdom because he went to work. Work. Part of our salvation is work. Doing work. Not sitting around, coming to church once a week, doing work all the rest of the days of the week, okay? Look at John 5.17. I was reading that this morning in my devotional. But Jesus answered them. This is the Pharisees. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. My father has been working until now. You see, we read Genesis chapter 1 when God creates everything. It says, and on the seventh day, God rested. Oh, God rested. God you know, kicked up on the lazy boy, put his feet up. I'm done. Six days, that was a lot. That was a tough creation. I'm done. You guys do whatever, and I'll, I'll see you at the end. You know, judgment day, I'll, I'll come back. No. When the Bible says that when, when, when God created the universe and created all of creation, and on the seventh day he rested, it means he was showing us a pattern that we need to rest. We shouldn't be working seven days. Only six days, and we rest on it because your body needs to heal up and to, to restore and to you know, rest, and so does your spirit. So you know, the, the Lord's day, the, the Sabbath, you know, we, we rest on Sabbath. But also, um, it was to show you know, that pattern of rest. But when it says that God rested, it didn't mean that he kicked up his feet on the lazy boy, that he was done work. It actually, in the Hebrew, it means that he was satisfied with what he had done and it was good, because doesn't the Bible say, and God looked at it and it was good. So one, looking at what he did, he was proud, he was happy, God was content with what he had done, and he rested. But the next day he went to work. Because it says here, my father has been working until now. Listen, if God's working, why aren't we working? And Jesus said, and I've been working, right? And in his great uh, priestly high prayer in John 17, Jesus says this to his, Jesus says this to his father as he's praying, <coughs> He says, I have glorified you. Jesus is praying to the Father. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work you have given me to do. Jesus says, I have glorified you. How? By finishing the work you have given me to do. Most people say, work? What work? What are we talking about work? I said, yes, I come, I come to church. I give money in the offering. What, what, what are we talking about? There's more? No. I have glorified you. How? By fulfilling and completing and finishing the work you have given me to do. How many here, if God called you home right now, could you stand before him and say, Lord, I've completed the work you've given me to do? How many here? Not me. I'm sorry. Put my hand down. Well, if your hand did not go up, there's some stuff that you and I need to do. Could we honestly say, Lord, I have done all that you've given me to do. If you haven't, like me, then we better put the boots on and get to work because there's a lot of work to do in the kingdom of God. And our salvation depends on the work that we do. Okay? Uh, we are called to work. God expects us to work. I know it's not convenient. It never is. But a servant, for, for a servant, work is never convenient. Okay? Uh, it's never the issue. Look at this. This is one of the things I learned in Bible school that Every time, Terry, I don't know if you, you read the Bible, you love the Bible, it's great. But there's verses in here that I don't like, that I wish God would take out. And Luke 17 is one of them. Every time I read it, I cringe and I feel guilty. Luke 17, um, verse 6, 6 to 10. And the Lord said, if you have a, f uh, no, uh, no, sorry, verse 7. Yeah, uh, Luke 17, 7 to 10. 
Which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he is coming to the house from the field, come, come at once, sit down and eat? Talking to the servant, right? But will he not rather say, prepare something for my supper, gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you can eat and drink? The master talking to the servant. Now, does he, the master, thank the servant because he did that which he was commanded to do? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all the things that you were commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants, for we have done that only which was our duty to do. Oh, I hate that, Fred. When you have done everything God has called you to do, Say, Lord, I'm no good. I'm unprofitable because I only did what I was expected to do. I hate that. That means there's room for improvement. Should the Lord thank us? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all you've been commanded to do, you say we are unprofitable because we've only done what we were told to do. You see, the Christian life is about going the extra mile. Right? Someone slaps you on the cheek, give me the other cheek. Someone asks for your tunic, give them the cloak. Someone asks you to go one mile, go two mile. What does that mean? Back in the day, you know, uh, Israel was, was, uh, was ruled by the Romans. And there was laws that had to be followed. So a Roman soldier could be walking with his bags, like his knapsack or his duffel bag, whatever, right? And um, two, you know, maybe a couple of Jews, maybe were kind of walking on the way to the market. The Roman soldier could say, hey, come here. And they had to come. Because remember, the Romans were in charge. And he says, come with me, pick up my bags, and follow me. So by law, the Jew had to carry the bag. Now, there was a, there was, there was a uh, um, part of the law said that they were only obligated to go one mile. So, okay. So the Roman can say, come two, three, four, no, one mile. And then he would just find another Jew, right? So pick up the bag. You go one mile, and boom, there's your bag, right? And off he went. But to the Christian, go a second mile. So you, come, take my bag. Yes, sir. How's it going? Man, beautiful day, man, the Lord is good. Boom. Okay, thank you, you've done it. No, no, can, can I go another mile? I'll go another mile. I, I want to go another mile. Ooh, what's this? what's this? Everybody else complains, this guy wants to go another mile? Yeah, it's called work. It's called doing more than we're, than we're called to do. Having the mentality that I want to work. I want to glorify God by how I work. You want to glorify God with your life? Get off your knees and stop just praying all day long. Do something for the kingdom. Your work glorifies God. My work glorifies God. We need to go the extra mile. Have a mentality. We've got to get rid of this white collar mentality and get a blue, blue collar mentality and go to work. There's a lot to do in the kingdom of God, and it means work. Man, you're quiet. No tomatoes in here, right? Okay, anyways. Uh, okay. Um, so, in salvation, from God's perspective, we're more than saved, we're more than Christian. We are first and foremost doulos, slaves, bondservants. And bondservants are called to work. Okay. Oswald Chambers, it's a devotional that I have. In one of his days, he says this, the Lord tells us how, we sh how love for him should manifest. So Jesus, Jesus tells us how our love for him is supposed to be. What's the proof of our love? He says to Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep, right? The test of our love for Jesus is practical, meaning if we really love him, we're gonna do some work for him. If you love me, feed my sheep. I don't, it's not about your interests. Identify your interests with my interests. My, feed need to be she, my, my sheep need to be fed. If you love me, feed them. If you love me, reach out to that person. If you love me, give them to that offering. If you love me, go talk to your neighbor. If you love me, that little old lady needs help, take her across the street. If you love me, your neighbor five, five doors down has no food in her fridge, go buy her groceries. Work. Work. We glorify God by the work that we do. And part of our salvation is work. Not coming to church on Sunday. I made it. Punch the clock, I'm in. Not just praying and reading the Bible. There has to be a practicality of it, right? 
1 Corinthians 3, 6, 9, 6, and 19, 6 through 9, Paul says this, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one. Each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. We are God's fellow workers. Each one is going to receive their own reward according to their own labor. Let me tell you something. I could use a lot of money. I could use a lot of nice things. I'm sure most of you can. But don't spend your time killing yourself for something that's going to be eaten by moths and rust and thief and coming in steel. You want treasure in heaven. The work that you do here for God is ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching going into your heavenly bank account because your reward will be determined by the work that you did. If you end up with no reward, it's not, your, it's not his fault, it's your fault, my fault. You want a reward in heaven that's going to last eternity? Get to work. Do you want to live in Motel 6 or Mansion? Anyways. So let, let me finish. I'm going to start landing this plane. Let, let, let me just kind of uh, take this thing away here. There's hope. There's hope. Cat, there's hope. Okay. Uh, now, if, so why is this such a problem that Christians don't like to work? Okay. If you look back through church history, back in the, you know, the, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, whatever, when man took over the church and basically kicked the Holy Spirit out, no, man began to administrate the church. You had councils, you had bishops, cardinals, popes, priests, the whole nine yards, right? What ended up happening, because back then, it's not like today. Most people were illiterate. They didn't have money. They were poor. They didn't have money to go to university. Only those who went to university or higher education usually became either a doctor or a scientist or a monk. And if you were a monk, you became a priest. So you learned Latin, you learned to read, you learned to write. Other people know. And so people still, they came to church, right? And what ended up happening was you had this division between the clergy and the laity. Us and them. The called ones. The priests. The smart ones. The ones who know the word of God and those who know nothing. And so week after week, you'd come to mass or to service, you know, on a Sunday, on a Saturday, on a Monday night, whatever. You would come and you would sit down in your chair. And the priest would give, you know, the, the, the word of God and he'd give the teaching. And people would sit there and nod, yes, I understand, yes, I feel convicted, yes, here's a plate, here's a, here, here's a loony, whatever. And you just went home. Next week, do the same thing. Rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And this mentality crept in that it's these ones behind the pulpit, the smart ones, the elected ones, the anointed ones, the called ones. They're the ones that does or that do the work of the kingdom. Me, I just sit back there, keep my nose clean, come to church and lead a nice life. And so we have this division and this understanding that it's the leadership of the church that does the work of the kingdom and it's not my responsibility and that is absolutely false. We are all called to do the work of the kingdom, okay? In modern Christianity, even though people receive Christ when they're at salvation, they say the prayer, Lord, come to my heart, forgive me, you're my Lord and Savior, right? But they fall into the trap of being saved to church. Because what happens when you become a Christian? Someone leads you to the Lord. You gotta pray. Sure, we'll pray. You gotta read the Bible. Read the Bible. Oh, and you gotta come to church. Find a good church, you come on a, Monday, uh, on a Sunday morning, maybe they have a midweek service on a Thursday or a Wednesday, join a Bible study, join a, join a men's group, have a man's breakfast, a woman's breakfast, and you get involved in church. And church becomes the foundation and the central point of your salvation. And now you become safe to church and not safe to God. Whatever the church does, is you wanna do. But nobody understands this concept that again, Salvation is positional. You and I are restored back to the place Adam had before he fell. See, when God created Adam, he didn't create him to go to church. When God created Adam, he didn't think, okay, sometime down the line, I'm going to have all these churches, all these people, all these pastors, all these bishops and you know, apostles, whatever, and Bible's going to come every Sunday morning. They're going to give their loonies, their twenties, their twenties, their fifties, and they're going to come back the next week and do rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. God's purpose for man was twofold. There was a local vision and a corporate vision. The local vision is here. Here's a garden. Get to work. This is what you are going to do for me. 
Now, what I'm going to do and what Terry does, you know, what Fred does, you know, what Barrington does, each one has his own work that we will give an account for. But there was a corporate vision, multiply, subdue, and take dominion over the earth. That's global. Advance the kingdom of God. Because what happened was the devil got the left foot of fellowship because God kicked him out of heaven because, he, you know, he, he wanted to take over. And so when the devil falls from heaven, where does he land? <clears throat> On earth. As a matter of fact, it says, it's either in Ezekiel, it could be Ezekiel or Isaiah, where it says, and you were in my garden. Talking about Satan. Was in the Garden of Eden. Kind of squirming around like a snake. Did you get that? Okay, yeah. Anyways, so God said multiply, subdue, and take dominion. You see, what happens when you multiply? You have babies. Now, Adam and Eve were children of light because they were created perfect with no sin. And as they created babies, they too would have been perfect and they would have had more babies and all these perfect people, sinless people, would fill the earth with light until the darkness was snuffed out. And the devil would get kicked off the earth too. Probably land on the moon or something, right? But that's God's plan was for that. It didn't happen. Man sinned and darkness fills the earth and God had to wipe them all out. Read Genesis chapter 6. God saw their hearts and saw that in their hearts was only evil continually. And God wiped them all out except for Noah and his family. God had to start all over again. But God's original plan wasn't for us to be here this morning in church. We were supposed to have taken over the earth long ago. But it didn't happen. So that's God's original purpose. And so when we get saved, God could have given up on Adam. Oh, gee whiz, I didn't see that coming. Hmm. Let's tell you what, Mark, here's what we're going to do. We're going to scrap that whole thing. We're going to scrap Adam, and we're going to start with Steve 2.0. We learn from our mistakes. This is what we do in the business world, in, in engineering, right, Rudy? This didn't work. We learn from it. Throw it away. Start again different, with a different angle. God didn't get rid of Adam. God saw value in Adam that he was willing to sacrifice his own son to get him back and get you back. Jesus' blood was shed on Calvary's cross that we would come back to God. And so when God created Adam, he says, these three things I want to give you, intimacy, authority, and a job. And when we are saved, we are put back into Adam's place before he fell. So we're like Adam. We have perfect intimacy, perfect authority, and we have a job to do. Most Christians don't know that. You and I will be judged for the work that we did or that we did not do. Okay? Um, people receive Jesus, go to church, and they sit in the pews waiting to die. Majority of them never fulfilling God's will for their lives or doing anything to advance the kingdom. Okay? Each of us has a job to do. And we should be spending most of our time doing that job. Okay? Each of us has a job to do, and we should be spending most of our time doing the Lord's work. We should be spending the majority of our time working. Now, let's not confuse that with doing works. Lord, I did this. Lord, okay, yeah, Lord, I'm not perfect, but look what I did over here. Look at all of this. And we have a works-saving mentality that I'm saved because of all the good things. I was raised you know, Catholic, and I was told that any time you do something good, God writes it in his book in gold. Ooh, Oh, but when you do something bad, ooh, the devil writes it in his book with fire. Ooh, that's how I was brought up. Fear. And so at the end of the day, when you die, those two books go on a scale. Ooh, ooh. And whichever way the, book, the, the scale flips determines your eternal destiny. So I was brought up in fear, Terry, not under a loving father. Man, I better do good. I better keep my nose clean. I better do good things because I don't want to go to hell. And that's a self-righteous works mentality. And that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not saying we work to gain salvation. We work because we're saved and we're supposed to be working, right? It says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you are saved by grace through faith. It is not of you, it is of God, not that any should boast. We're saved by faith through grace. And in verse 10, nobody reads it, but you were created in Christ, in, in, his, in his workmanship, to do the works that God has ordained beforehand, that we should walk in them, Right? You're created as, as, as a workmanship in Christ to do the works that God has ordained beforehand that you would walk in them. In other words, when we work, we are walking in obedience to what God already told us we have to do in life. When we don't work, we are disobedient and in sin. Did I just say that? 
When we don't work, we are in disobedience and we're in sin. We're in rebellion. Let me read that and, 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 I, and I'll close, my first close. Right? Okay. Uh, Ephesians, because I want to make sure I get this right. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Okay. Chapter 2, sorry, chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10. Okay. For by grace you have been saved through faith, which you know, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we are saved not by works, but by faith through God's grace. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works. We were created for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I'm saying if we were created for good works and we don't do them, we are in sin. We're in rebellion because we're against, going against God's word. I hope I'm driving this home. We are called to work. It is part of your salvation. Right? We need to work. Okay? We will be judged in the end by the works that we did or didn't do. And the Bible is very clear. Our works are going to be tested. And here's a scary thought. If our works are going to be tested, it means that we will be given an account. We will give an account. We will stand before the Lord and give an account. Don't believe me? Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. The Lord and master goes away to a faraway land to inherit a kingdom. And before he leaves, he gives his servants, his doulas, his bond servants, some talents. You know, occupy, do business until I return. To one he gives five. To one he gives two, and to one he gives one, each according to their own ability. God's not going to ask you to do something you can't do. God's going to give you the ability and the resources. So one he gave five, one he gave two, one he gave one. Comes back, and it says, and the master came back to, to uh, take accounts with his servants, right? Matthew chapter 25. And really quickly, again, this is not my notes, but I'm just going, going there, Okay. Uh, 25, uh, 26, here we go, okay. Parallel of Towns, okay, here it goes. After a long time, verse 19, chapter 25, the Lord of those servants, are we servants? Yeah. Came back and settled accounts with them. Jesus will settle accounts with you and me. The one who did five, Lord, I worked and I made five more. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. The one who did two, made two more. So, Lord, I made two more. Excellent. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. It doesn't matter if you made five or two or three. You did something with it. You went to work. And the reward is the same. Listen, my only hope in life, Charlene, is that when I stand before him, I, I don't want to hear, nice try. Or what happened? Or I, I never knew you. What I want to hear is, well done, thy good and faithful servant, not good and faithful pastor or teacher or apostle. Servant. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You were, you were faithful in a little. I'm going to give you much. Enter into the joy of your master. But to the one who gave, to, he gave him one, he said, well, I was scared of you. You're a harsh guy. So I took it in a handkerchief and I hid it in the ground. Here's your thing. In other words, what did he do? Zip. He did no work. And the Lord calls him a wicked and lazy servant. And it kicks him out to the place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, he didn't make it because he was lazy. Your goal in life, Denise, Angela, Joyce, my goal in life is to hear, well done, thy good and faithful and servants work. You are saved to work. Not to gain your salvation, but to do work. Thomas Edison, ever heard of him? Guy that invented, thank you Thomas, we got lights. He invented the light bulb. Took him a thousand tries, but he got it, right? Thomas Edison said this, opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. Opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. How many here are praying for revival? Did you know that revival takes a lot of work? In the heat of revival in Brownsville, because I went to Brownsville School of Revival during the revival years, 
people, they, um, God was there so strong, they had a service every single night. People would be in service till like 12, 11, 12, 1 in the morning. They would go home, get up, go to work, leave 5, go home, shower, grab a sandwich, and go right back to church. Day in and day out. Because when revival hits, and it will hit, we're going to need ushers. We're going to need catchers. We're going to need a prayer team. We're going to need video people. We're going to need sound people. We're going to need camera people. We're going to need people in, in children's church. We're going to need, we, we are going, if we're going to host revival, get rid of that stinking um, pride. Oh, we're going to host revival. God's here. We're going to host revival. You know what it means to host? Have you ever hosted a dinner? How easy was that? Days of preparation, cooking and cleaning and buying and setting the table. Work. If we want to host revival, all hands on deck. Everybody has to work. If, if this church is your home and you believe revival is coming, you better get to work. We're going to need you. If Pastor Patty or Pastor Alex ever say, hey, you know, we need to do this on, on Saturday, who can come? Every hand better go up. That is the Lord's work. Let me finish by saying something here and we'll be done. Um, two verses, Haggai. Haggai chapter 1. If I can find Haggai, I lost it here. Well, in Haggai, I don't want to use uh, verses 1 through 11. Basically, God had called them back out of Babylon and, and they went back, and God says, Okay, I want you to build my house, build a temple. And years went by, and nobody built a temple. But they built their nice paneled houses. And God says, What do you mean it's not time to build my house? Yet each of you runs to your own paneled house? You work much and you gain little. You put money in your pocket and I put a hole in it. Your, your vines are dry. You're, you're not advancing because I just blow it all away. Why? Because you run to your panel houses and my house is in ruins. They neglected the work of the house of the Lord and God cursed them. They didn't have enough money, they didn't have food, nothing. They worked extra hours and they got zippo because they neglected the work of the house of the Lord. Work. And I'll finish with this. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 36. I promise this is the end. John, Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 36. This is Jesus. But I have greater witness than John's for the works which my Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. I have a greater witness than John the Baptist for the works which my Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. When you work God's work, it bears witness that he has sent you. It bears witness that he is your Father, the very works that he has given you to do. We all need to work. We need to change our mentality. We need to put the boots on, the collar on, and get to work. It's never convenient, but that's not the point. If we are servants, uh, the, the servant never, ne the master never says to the servant, hey, are you available on Tuesday? Can you come like Wednesday morning? No, do this and just get it done. We're servants. Your salvation, when you said yes, you received intimacy, authority, and a job. We all have a garden to tend. We all have a job to do. So what can you do? Well, each of you need to understand what did God call you to do? God's called me to be a teacher. He's called me to full-time ministry. You know, you have Mark and Barrington. They're entrepreneurs. That they're businessmen, kingdom businessmen. You know, Vicky, she's not here, but she drives a taxi, right? You know, Denise works in accounting. Fred was, you know, doing uh, driving school lessons and, and whatever. You know, Charlene was a nurse. Wherever God has put you, do your work in excellence unto the Lord. Aside from that, what can you do for the kingdom of God? Someone needs prayer? Pray for them. Someone needs groceries? Buy them groceries. Someone needs help at church to do the to mop and clean the floors? Come and help in the church. Always be looking for an opportunity to serve. We shouldn't ask. We shouldn't be asked to do something. Our mentality should be, well, how can I be a blessing? When I was traveling in my job as an engineer, I worked all, uh, all over the world. I, went, I found a church for six weeks a month because uh, I traveled quite a bit. I would come in, hi, my name is Miguel. I'm you know, working on telecom. I'm here with your telephone company. I'm here for six weeks. What can I do for you? How can I serve you? When I finished Bible school, I didn't have any direction from the Lord. 
Other people did. You know, I wasn't from Canada. Most students were from the States. They went back to their churches or whatever. I didn't. I, I, actually, I got saved traveling. I didn't even have a home church in Canada. I wasn't saved when I left. So I didn't have a place to come back to. So I did a missions trip in Mexico in Querétaro. So I said, you know what? I just feel I need to go there for a few months. I, I don't want to, you know, it's easier to move a car that is moving than one that is parked. So I just want to do something. So, I, so my, the missions guy, we called, said, you know, Pastor, I was there. You remember me. I was there at Christmas for nine, nine days. I'd like to come down. He goes, why? What do, why? Why do you want to come down? I said, because right now I have no direction from the Lord. I want to do something, and I want to come, and I want to serve you. That's all I want to do. It's not about me. Pre, you know, yeah, I graduated from Brownsville. Who cares? I don't title. I don't want nothing. I want to serve you however you need me. And he goes, wow, come. So I went to Mexico. I was a missionary for three, for three months. Then God called us back to Canada. And I believe that I'm here today partly because of those decisions that I made to work. You are called in your salvation to intimacy, to authority, and to work. Look for opportunities to serve. Move, advance the kingdom of God. Every chance that you get, do something for the Lord because you will glorify him by the works that you do. And one day we will all stand before him and be judged for what we did and did not do. I don't want to come to him with an empty bag. All the works that he has given me to do, I have finished. Could you honestly say right now, if you stood before him, Lord, I have done everything you've asked me to do. If not, there's room for improvement. Father, we thank you this morning for the time here in your presence. And I'm asking, Lord God, that you would just touch our hearts. Father God, that you would just move upon us and give us a revelation that we need. Father, may we be like Jesus when he was 12 years old, that I must be about my father's business. Help us to know what that business is. Give us opportunities to serve. Mm. Give us a heart to serve. Help us to work and advance your kingdom. And Father, we just thank you that your word is true. Lord, I believe I've done whatever you've asked me to do this morning. I gave you a message, and Lord, may we all be convicted, me included, especially. May I get to work advancing your kingdom. And Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.